Okay, so let's go to uh, lecture 26 and let's go over it again. Uh, we have enough time. So, on the final exam, you can expect one or two questions on ODE solvers, okay? Where you typically use the built in ODE solver ODE 45. So, you should know how to use that with a single differential equation and with coupled differential equations. Okay? So what's also important to know is the difference between a explicit and an implicit solver. So an explicit solver is one where you define the step size. So you define at which values you're going to evaluate the derivative. That's going to be at the starting point, that's going to be at the middle of the interval, if you do the midpoint method or Hoen's method or the Runga-Kutta method, and that's going to be at the upper bound of the interval. And that's how, then you move to the next one, etc. Those are explicit solvers, so you define that variable h that the author uses ahead of time. Implicit solvers, you do not have to define a step size because the implicit solver will choose the step size in such a way that the error of the numerical estimate of y of the differential the solution of the differential equation is as small as possible and the step size depends on how much your differential equation changes so dy dt how much that changes in the interval so if that changes too much, then it decides, you know what, I have to take a smaller step size because if my derivative here is zero and here it's 10, then likely in this interval it's changing a lot, so it's not really going to be accurate if I make a direct step forward in integration directly to here. So it's going to say, and of course for you guys it's the other way around. Yeah, we're moving this way, yeah? I move this way, yeah? But I hope you understand, yeah? So implicit solvers are better for the, they are more efficient. They need a smaller number of time steps or a, a, a smaller number of uh, steps to get to the same answer, okay? Like Euler's method, you'll get the perfect answer if you take a really small time step, a really small value for h, but that means that you need to do a lot of evaluations over time because you use a really small time step h, you have to evaluate the differential equation at many, many, many locations, whereas an, ex an implicit solver can take larger steps because the implicit solver chooses its time step based on the change in dy dt and they're typically, they're better. So MATLAB has built-in functionalities to solve differential equations, and that's the ODE 45, ODE 113, ODE whatever, 15. There's all kind of different solvers, but for now, and all these different solvers work for different type of mathematical functions, okay? But ODE 45 is pretty good just as a general solver. So again, Let's now go to a coupled ordinary differential equation, okay? Now we talked about this, explicit, implicit solver. So this is an example of a coupled differential equation. Let's just come up with an, uh, an, an example here, this one here. This is an example here of a coupled system of equation, coupled system of differential equations also called ordinary differential equations. So we have two variables, y1 and y2. So in the past we only had one variable, y. In this case we have two variables, y, which are y1 and y2, and they're interacting on each other. Yeah, so they interact, they interact on each other. So if y2 changes, y1 will change because y2 appears in the equation of y1. Look at line 109. So y1 appears in y2 and y2 appears in y1 and that's why they are coupled. 
Okay, so please look carefully when you look at the exam question, check whether these systems, uh, whether these equations are actually coupled, because I can also give you two differential equations in a, like this that are not coupled because they don't share variables. In this case, they do, and that's why we call them coupled. So the solution to this coupled system of equations is the same as if you only have one equation. You can solve this with an inline function, or you can solve this with a script. Like, for instance, we can write a script here, where we have a function script, so we don't use an inline function. We do the same thing, but we write a function script that says, function dy dt, so dy dt is, has two numbers, yeah? The first dy dt1 is dy1 over dt, and dy dt2 is dy2 over dt. Is, nah, the name of the function, rhs, and then sys from system, and then input argument, again, always time as first, yeah? So remember that, time, the value of y, and y consists of two values, because we have y1 and we have y2, yeah? And then the third input argument is something that we call a flag. It's not so important at this point, but remember we had examples that we covered on Friday, yesterday, where we had additional variables that needed to be passed on to the function, like alpha. You can use that with a flag like this, but for now that's not so important because we don't use the flag. So you see on line three, where we compute dy dt, we have two equations. The first equation is minus y1 times exponent one minus t plus 0 0.8 times y2. That is dy1 dt. And then separated with a semicolon, we had another equation, which is dy2 dt, and that was y1 minus y2 to the power 3. So if I, in this function, if I, we can run this function. So imagine that uh, I say let's use a time of 1. My y values are uh, 1 or like 2 and 2 or so, or 2 and 0 and my flag is zero. You see, now I'm going to get out of this function. At the time of one, a value of y1 is two, the value of y2 is zero, and a flag of zero, and again, that's not important. I could have put a flag of one or 10 or 100, I would have gotten the same answer. That's just, the flag is just used for if you want to pass on extra variables later. This is dy1 dt, this is dy2 dt. So dy dt gives us two answers because we have a system with two equations. Okay? Now, once we have written our system like this in a function script, and we could have done the same with an inline function here, we'll get back to that in a second. Now what we can do, after we specify the initial values, y0, now we can actually run the function script using the Runga-Kuda solver, okay, which will be the same essentially as the ODE. So we will get also back to what this solver does in a second. So this is the name of the solver. So this is, would, would have been the same if we used ODE 45 essentially. This is the name of the function, that script that we wrote, yeah, that's this function script that we just wrote between parentheses and then this is the end time, this is the step size, and this is the initial value of y. And because we have two values of y, you specify the initial value of y1 and the initial value of y2. Now if we execute this, then what we can do is we can make a nice plot, and that's how it looks. Yeah? According to our ODE solver with the Runga-Kuta method that the author talks about, 
this is the solution that you're getting for y1 and y2. And remember, y1, the initial value was zero. And y2, the initial value was two. And that's what you see. Look at time zero. You see that y1 is zero and then increases and that y2 at time zero starts at two and then decreases over time. And then at one point after 1.5 or so increases again. So essentially, this is time, yeah, which is a single vector because at each time we have two values of y. So if I look at the output of this system, yeah, if we do this again, then we have time. This is how time looks. And we use an explicit solver, remember, this is the RK, Runga-Kuda method, and which uses an explicit solver of 0.1, and that's what you see in time. You see that the time is updated 0.1 each step. You see that it ends here, this is the final step, and it's, you see that it ends at 3. Yeah? And the y0 are the initial values. So this is time, and the y values are just, this is how y comes out. This is, the first column is y1, the second column is y2. So I can add, if I want, I can have six coupled equations, or 10, or 20. Yeah? You just set up the function script, that RHS system. We can set that up. We can, we can add more equation to this if we want. We can add, like, uh, we put another uh, uh, semicolon here, and we add something like y3 minus y2 uh, squared minus y1, whatever, and then we can add y4 if we want. We can add a lot of equations if we want. Yeah, we can all do that in the function script here. And then we can run it. You just specify for each y value, you specify initial value, so if you have four equations, then this becomes, this will have four values, because for each y value, y1, y2, y3, y4, you specify their starting value. Now, and then you, you run the solver. Now, this is the Runga-Kuta solver, okay? So this is the result that you will get. We can solve the same thing with the ODE solver, and that's easier. Because now, again, this is our function script. This is the end time, and this is our starting value. So the difference with the Runga-Kuda solver here is that we don't have to specify the step size. Because this is an implicit solver, which will figure out what step size to use. It will start with a certain step size that's hardwired, that the code knows, and then it will just somehow update that. And so what you'll see with time, this is what happens with time? Look, the initial step size is really small, and then it becomes larger and larger if you go towards the end of the interval. You see that here? The initial value here, look at the difference of t. So now we're going to get the difference between two subsequent numbers, and they're really small, almost zero. So initially, the step size is really small, and then Later in the interval, when we approach the end, the step size gets larger. Now, obviously, we can also plot these results. And this is what you get when you use the built-in ODE45 solver. And it looks pretty much the same. It's nearly identical. So. So this is important, yeah, that you know how to solve a coupled system of equations. It's essentially the same as a single system of equation. Again, if we have a single equation, you can use also a function script with just a single equation, yeah, where you just end this, where you can only have y1 because you only have a single equation, but you just end it here and you remove this. Okay? So, now, what I did is 
the authors, as you see, they use this function script to use a coupled system of equation. That's what the author suggests to do. And that has advantages, but it's much easier if you can use, just use an inline function because then you don't have to write this. Essentially, inline function is the same, but it is possible that you actually use an inline function with a coupled system of equation. And that's what we just did here, where look at the equation where I have an inline function that I specify that consists of two different equations separated with a semicolon. This is the first part, that is dy1 dt, and this is the second part which is dy2 dt, okay? And then this is ultimately how our function script looks. F test, that was the name, yeah? I said F test is inline, so F test is our function script name. Inputs are again time up front, and then our Y values. And Y again consists of two values, because we have a Y1 and we have a Y2 in both equations. So if I only specify one as a scalar, then this function script is not going to run, it should give an error. If I say, give me, you see, it gives an error because it assumes that y has two elements because we're talking about y1 and y2. So if I do 1 and 2 and 0, I have back what I had back according to our function script that we wrote, this RHS system. And this might be easier for you to use an inline function. And obviously we can run that inline function just using the same thing as like this, though the 45 solver. And then we can plot, and we'll just do this with a different color. We'll do this in, uh, and sorry for the colors. And now you see they're identical. So, oh, interesting. So, you see here, we have essentially the same fit. But now we used an inline function. So whether you use an inline function, or uh, whether you use ftest, or you use this script, you're gonna get the same answer. Using a script like this is a little bit more general because you can add more input variables on top using that flag option if you want to. So it's a little bit more flexible. But for what you need to know in the exam, an inline function should be sufficient. So I will send you, by the way, this latest script, okay? Because it differs a little bit from what I sent you um, previously because I started doing some additional research on the internet. That's typically how I work with MATLAB, so if I'm stuck, I just go to Google and I just try to find information about something. The same you can do if you wonder like, hey, I like to test my knowledge, you go to Google and you just write, give me an example of coupled ordinary differential equations, yeah? Now, then there, is, there will be people in this world that have up uploaded a PDF document or a Word document or something else where they, where they give the system of equations and then they, they provide a plot with the solution, how that looks. Then just look at the system of equations they specified, the ODEs, the coupled ODEs, implement that and then compare that against the graph that they actually created. Those are the things that that's a way to test whether you know what you're doing because there is coupled system of equations and to be honest, it's sometimes not easy to create coupled system of equations. And why is that? Because one might go to infinity or minus infinity, so it might show unstable behavior. Okay, so that's why it's not that you can just come up with any coupled system of equations because they're coupled it can show really strange behavior. That's why the predator-prey is so nice, because it shows such a nice cyclic behavior. Now, so this demo of the predator-prey, so this is the 
the underlying idea. Yeah? Like we have a coupled system of equation where we have an equation for the abundance, so that's the number of the, the preys, then the number of preys, or so the prey population size, and we have an equation for the predator population size. Now the prey is denoted here with P1, and the predator here is P2. So we have dp1 dt, so the change in the prey population as function of time is alpha 1, is just a constant that we, that we supply, times the predator or the prey population, minus delta 1 is another constant that we provide, times the prey population, times the predator population. Okay? So alpha 1 and delta 1 are two constants that we provide. Then the predator population, the change in the predator population over time is alpha 2, is another constant alpha, so alpha has two constants, alpha 1 and alpha 2, times the prey population, times the predator population, minus delta 2 is another constant, delta 1, delta 2, times the predator population. Okay? Now, the author, so these are the equations, and they're very well known in biology, ecology, okay? So this is, these are really famous equations. So and how does this work? And it's the same as with humans. If there's too many humans on this world, and there's not enough food, there people will starve. So the, the number of individuals the population size will go down. Then when that goes down, there will be more food available again and then it will go up. So there's a continuous yeah, trade-off between the two. And it's the same with the predator and the prey. Like if there's a lot of prey, then the predators have lots of food available and they can grow abundantly. Because of that, the prey population will go down yeah, and that because of that there's no longer enough food available and the predator population will go down. As soon as the predator population goes down, the prey will go up again. So there's this interaction between the two. And the author here, remember alpha and uh, delta, you see, he wrote this script where you see as function of time, and time is in arbitrary units, so time is not in seconds, in days, so don't think that this is a minute or so, that this is 30 minutes or that's 30 days, okay? There needs to be some scaling later involved, okay? But this is the underlying idea, is where we specify alpha 1 and alpha 2, and we specify delta 1 and delta 2. And based on those values, you solve the system of equation, and then you plot the prey and the predator population. And you see the cyclic behavior. And you see that as soon as the prey population goes down, that there's a little bit of a shift in time between the two. And they interact. So obviously we can open up this edit demo predator prey. Dot m. This is the demo that he write, that the author wrote. So the input is what is the starting value of P1. So what's the population of prey? What's the population size of the predators? And when do we stop? What's the last value of the time? Okay. Now and here he specified the alpha and beta values. And obviously we can change these, or the alpha and delta values. So we can change these values. If we change these values, we're going to get different dynamics. Yeah? So we have an alpha 1 and an alpha 2, which are specified in the alpha factor, and we have a delta 1 and a delta 2, which are specified in the delta factor. Now, and then the next line, what you see, is that the initial condition, so the initial population size, is the population of the prey and the population of the predator. So these are two numbers because we have two equations and we're solving for two populations. So we need two numbers, two initial conditions, yeah? And then we solve on the next line 21 using the OD45 solver. We specify that we have the 
the name of the function, that's RHS pop2, and that implements our equation. So we can open up that These are the equations that we had. Remember, if we go back to our main script, demo uh, or like uh, lecture 26, so we can copy paste this quickly in here. Yeah, so dp1 dt, that's the, this, this the first uh, line, yeah, is alpha 1 times p1 minus delta 1 times p1 times p2. So that's this equation. Second equation is this one, is alpha 2 times p1 times p2 minus delta 2 times p2. So essentially, we just put these equations into a script here. And why is it now useful to use a script and not an inline function? This goes back to our flag, is that now we have additional variables that we need to pass on to this function. And of course, we can hardwire these values alpha and delta in an inline function. But what scientific programmers like to do, they like to make these functions as generic as possible. And so you do not want to hardwire certain constants, variables, in codes. What you want to do is you want to specify those in an input file and then be able to run the program instead of having to go back into the function and having to change the numbers for alpha and delta. Because these are what they're called parameters. Different values of alpha and delta will give us different behavior. So that's why in this case it's an advantageous to use a script like this instead of an inline function. And again, first input variable time, second input variable, in this case p, which is similar to y, but the populations were called p1 and p2, that refers to population, the p from population, then the flag, and then alpha and delta. And if we go back to our demo, then what you see here, how you can run something like this is where we specify that our function is indeed RHS pop2. Then with the OD solver, we need to specify an end time at least. We can specify also the times in between that we want output, but the minimum that we need to specify is the last time. You can either specify all the times in between that you want a prediction of P1 and P2 or the simulation, yeah? But in this case, the only thing we provide is the stop time, is 30 or so. And then P0, then something that's empty because that's the flag. And then alpha and delta. Because alpha and delta are the variables that need to be passed on to this function. And look now, if you look at our function, and this might be a little unclear, we have T, P, flag, which is empty, and then alpha and delta. Okay? So if we go back to our demo here, we have function name. This is T, this is P, this is flag, this is alpha, this is delta. So it's the same order, essentially. ODE 45. So again, the most important thing is that likely we're not going to use this on the exam. In other words, you're, you're going to work with couple differential equations in which alpha and delta are just fixed. They're not varying, okay? So we're just doing one run with fixed values for alpha and delta. But this is useful to know that you can also run these equations with, where the differential equations have additional variables. And here we just plotted the output. You see, we have a subplot. We have two subplots, and this is the first of the two subplots. And we plot time versus the first column of P. And P will have two columns, yeah? P1 and P2. The first column will be the prey population. The second column then here, that's the next subplot, that's two subplots, one comma two, is the second column of P. And we add labels here and a title, obviously. So that's why if we run this demo, 
we're going to get something like this. And obviously what we now can do is we can change these values. We can say, you know what, make alpha 5, make this a little bigger, make this a little smaller, and make this like 0 0.2. And now we can rerun it. And I have no idea how this looks. Now you get this type of behavior. So you see, you get really strange behavior suddenly. Okay? So, and that's what I told you, is that these differential equations, these coupled differential equations can be very sensitive to certain settings. So this doesn't really look like anything, does it? So that means that these alpha and delta values probably in the biological literature, they're limited to certain narrow ranges that then behaves as what you've seen in practice. Otherwise, now what we just saw doesn't look like anything that we can explain. It looks really strange. Yeah, there's, you don't really see this cyclic behavior very well. So we can remove this. So again, we specified alpha and delta here. We could have also done that if you wanted that directly. We could have inserted their values in here. We could have fixed those values immediately. But we didn't do that. So that in the demo that you can outside the function, you can specify those variables. And that's what a scientific programmer likes to do. So that in an input file that has nothing to do with your code, you can specify for what alpha and delta values you like to run your program. So that you don't have to go in your program, but only have to change something in an input file. Okay. So let's look at our little doggy for a second. And then, so I never really liked dogs, by the way. That's really true. So I used to do a lot of fishing when I was younger, yeah? And I remember one time I was like, I'm from the Netherlands, yeah? So we, we drink and drive, ride a bike, yeah? That's what we do. <laughs> so I was riding my bike, yeah? And um, so when you first come to America, these are things that you say, I was driving my bike. Yeah, these are things you, you have to get used to, like proper English a little bit. I still suffer from that all the time. And I talk to people, they're like, what the heck are you talking about? I said, yeah, if you can tell me, I don't know, actually. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so what happened is I was like fishing, and we would always fish in areas where you're not allowed to fish, yeah? And then the, these big dogs would come up to you. Now, it's one time we got so scared that we actually crossed a big f Dutch freeway. Believe it or not, yeah? And so these people in the car there, they must have thought these people are really nuts. They're walking there with their fishing rod, yeah? <laughs> They're crossing a freeway, but these were like two Doberman Pinschermen, and they were like so, they were so wild, they were just running at us like, like crazy, and I, based on the way they looked at us. And then one time, but they only barked, and then one time I'm fishing, and this really small dog, like this size, actually grabbed my leg, hang on to my leg for like, 10 seconds while I was biking, yeah? So he ended up at another place somehow, yeah? And I was like, what the heck is this at my leg, yeah? So anyway, from that moment on, I never liked dogs anymore. Like, like these dogs, these things are crazy, yeah? But anyway, so then I met this other dog, his name was Norman, and uh, I initially I didn't like him. I would tell him, like, he was in my house, and they de hair, yeah? That's the sad thing, yeah? Like we have that as well, but it's not so noticeable, but they shed these dogs, yeah? So then in summertime, oh my God. So I would tell them, sit still, don't move, like really German style, yeah? So sit still, don't move, and all that. And then one time he got so scared initially that he started to pee suddenly. I picked him up like, what the heck did you just do, yeah? So now nah, anyway, so initially the first three, four weeks, we weren't really friends. I was like, this dog, you know, I, I tend to be a little, generally tend to be clean in my house. And he was just like messing up my house. And I was like, what the heck, you know, like this is like, this is no good. So sleep on the balcony at night. These are things that I did as a kid, yeah. Don't tell anyone. God, I, my parents go to jail still, yeah. But yeah, so, and anyway, so he did that initially, but over time, over time, it's like a kid, you actually start to like it, yeah? And, uh, and then you, you, you build this really close relationship. And uh, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's, those are dogs. They're nice animals, yeah? They're loyal, yeah? That's a good thing. That's, people are different, yeah? Honestly. 
honestly think about that. Like, uh, that, that's really true. That's really true. Like, uh, we can write books about that. But uh, anyway, so uh, let's continue with something else, yeah? Uh, programming. That is really interesting. Um, so, that, that, so has the final evaluation been activated or not? Yeah? Okay, good. Very good. I hope you guys are at least a little bit positive. Because usually what happens that if the if the evaluation is negative, then then you know it's it's the the fault of the TAs, yeah. And if it looks really good, then of course it's all my work, yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. No, no. But I'm happy. We're happy when you fill out the evaluation because it's useful for us. Sometimes you there's times like that you only get like 20 people filling that out, yeah. So you get an extremely biased, like evaluation and and usually the people that are really don't like it they write these really long stories yeah so when they turn in their exam they write like really short answers yeah but when they actually evaluate your class they suddenly start writing like crazy it's unbelievable yeah that you would have to read for hours and hours and hours and so hopefully this time it's going to be okay so let's go over one more thing here, and those are the options that you can specify with the ODE solver. Yeah? You see here that with the ODE solver, remember one of the things is that the ODE solver is an implicit solver, so we don't specify a time, a sti uh, a time step, age. So in the ODE solver, there is a place somewhere that actually takes some initial time step. And that is a setting, that is a default value. And those are things you can actually change. So if we go to, that is a, something that's called ODE set. You see here that ODE set is all the options that are built in the ODE solver that you can exercise and can change. And you see, for instance, here, you have an absolute tolerance. Yeah, that means like how close do you want to be to the true result? You have a relative tolerance. You have something that's called a norm control, non-negative. There's a, a, the output function. There's like, you see here, there's an initial step. Okay, so that means that there is a number there. The initial step, which is, it says there it's a positive scalar. Yeah, the step, the time step cannot be negative. Yeah, we, we need to move forward in time. So, but that is some positive scalar that MATLAB has hardwired into the ODE solver. But we can change that. There is also something that's called the maximum step. So, what is the maximum step you can take with the ODE solver? Now, et cetera. And there's uh, lots of other things. And you can change some of these settings if you want to do that. So... One of the ways, for instance, I think we did that here somewhere, and uh, we can ODE, like, so we define that the options that we define are just the ones that the ODE solver defines, yeah? So if we go to options and then we go to, I think it's called uh, max step. So it's not defined here, let's see here. I think we take the standard options, but anyway, if you want to, you can actually, oh, we have to define this outside. You can actually run the code with different, oh, delta. We have to specify those as well. Here, we have the output. So we're doing essentially the same thing now here, but then not in the demo, but we now run the OD solver outside the demo. And the options are now used as the flag, yeah? which we first left empty, so we didn't specify any uh, options, the flag, and these are again alpha and delta values. If we like, we can change the settings of the options. We can change the initial time step, for instance, because what you've seen, if you look at the time here, initially, now here it's not too bad. It goes from 0 to 0 0.25, because remember, I... Uh, yeah, but if you, if you want to make sure that your initial time step is not smaller than a certain value, you can change that in the option settings, okay? And it's not important for now, okay? So we will not cover it. I think the book talks about that a little bit because the book comes up with an example there how to change that. But for us, it's typically not important. But you can imagine that 
MATLAB assumes a certain initial time step, it uses that time step and then it determines is this time step too big or is it too small and then it adjusts that time step or it, it, or it keeps the same time step. But for some problems you know that the initial time step needs to be really, really small, smaller than what MATLAB suggests or much larger. So you can change it, but for what we do it's fine, you don't have to change it, I just want to show that there's a lot of options associated here with the ODE solver that you can all define yourself. Okay? So I don't know how this works again, this has been a time ago, but if we look at for instance max step, oh we need to do that differently. Anyway, it's in the book. I never use the ODE solver so um, we do other things with uh, MATLAB. So I will send you my latest script that shows how you can actually use an inline function to solve because at one point I suggest here this is what you have. We can no longer use an inline function to do the work if we have a coupled system of equation. After I checked it out later functions or later versions of MATLAB actually allow to do that by using the semicolon. Okay, and by using it, uh, by setting up this way, inline, where you specify the variables later here. Okay, so that's important, okay? For you, it might be very useful to know this, this line, how to do this. Why? Because we're not going to typically use, you could solve your problem without the function script. We're not going to use problems where you have an alpha and a delta. Typically, you're going to have one where you just have an equation like this. Like we could have specified this as alpha for instance, where we change this value from 1 to 0 0.8, 0 0.6. Here everything is hardwired, yeah? And the only thing that are unknown are y1, y2 and time, instead of additional variables, constants like alpha, delta, beta, whatever. So, okay, so are there any questions related to the ODE solvers? this chapter because we can still cover the Runga Kuda solver but it's not so important for now like the the system if we use the ODE uh, let's see I think it's up here here yeah where we use the Runga Kuda for the coupled ODEs I just we already exercised the, the function but essentially it's the same as for a single equation okay we just have k1, k2, k3, k4, which we have for the single equation, single differential equation. We now have two of those because we have y1 and we have y2. So essentially it's the same script, but now you have k1, k2, k3, k4 for two variables, y1 and y2, or p1 and p2. And so it's the same, same concept, okay? And once you have these solutions, then this is how you update, and that's again the same step where the new y1 value is the old y1 value plus h is the time step times k1 divided by 6 plus k2 divided by 3 plus k3 divided by 3 plus k4 divided by 6. So again, for the interval over which you integrate, which is h, you define four different values for dy, d, d, uh, t, and then you average them, not some av a normal weighting, but this one you divide by 6, this one divided by 3, this one divided by 3, and this one divided by 6. And for the first one, y1, you use the equa or the derivatives k1, 1. K1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1. Now the second value, y2, at the next time, this is the same equation, but you use k1 for number 2, k2, number 2, k3, number 2, k4, number 2. So essentially it's the same, but now you have k1, k2, k3, k4 for two different variables, y1 and y2, or p1 and p2. Yes, yeah, so it doesn't matter, you can call it anything you like, y, uh, x, whatever you like to call it, you just need to do it consistently. So this is how the solver works. So again, Euler's method 
integrates to the next time using only information about the current value and the derivative at the current value. Then you have the midpoint method that says no, that is too risky. If I want to go from here, I move forward to here. Then I don't only need the value over here and the derivative of the function over here. Let's just first calculate the function value in the middle and the derivative in the middle and then assume that this derivative in the middle is applicable for the entire interval. That's the midpoint method. Then Hearn's method says, you know what, no, let's not only use the midpoint value, let's just use the average of the value for dy dt over here, derivative, and the, the one in the middle. We just use the average and apply that to the entire interval. And then this Runge-Kutta method assumes that no, let's not use two derivatives, let's use the one at the lower end, k1, let's use the one in the middle, k2, at k3 also in the middle, and then k4 at the upper bound. So it uses four different derivatives, and k2 and k3 are both in the middle, but they differ the way the y value has been calculated. Okay? Because I can calculate the y value in the middle from k1, the first derivative over here and then, but I can also calculate the y value from the derivative that I have over here, k2, going back to k1, I use k2, uh, going back to y1 here at the start, I use k2 to calculate the value in the middle of the integral. So these are just the different methods of which the more derivatives you use, dy dt values or dp dt, the more accurate your result is going to be, which makes sense, yeah? because your function is dynamic, so the more estimates you have about the actual derivative, the more accurate your estimate of y is going to be. Now this is essentially uh, all the material of the, um, yeah, of the book of which we didn't cover chapter 5, and so the final exam, what's really important are the ODE solvers, the numerical integration and the interpolation, okay? The last three chapters. And please study, I expect you to know, I already wrote that in an email uh, last uh, yesterday, I expect you to know when it comes to interpolation what an interpolator is with a monomial basis and a Lagrange basis, okay? You should be able to program those yourself, okay? The Newton basis where you have a quadratic form and a cubic form gets a little bit, gets way more compli complicated because you need to divide the differences. So, but please have a look at that. But please know the monomial and the Lagrange basis, how to compute that. You should know what the difference is between interpolation and piecewise interpolation. Where you, instead of with interpolation you fit one interpolate it through all the data, whereas with piecewise interpolation you just focus on certain small trajectories where you like to interpolate. So when, if you like to interpolate that x is 1, you, you choose the, uh, the value at the lower bound of x is 1 and the one at the upper bound of x is 1. And then somehow, so like for instance x is 0 and x is 2, and you use those three values then, or two values to create an interpolator and then you have different interpolators and those are built in MATLAB. So you should know the built-in interpolation functions in MATLAB, like interp1 and then the spline interpolator. Those you should know how to work with, okay? Because you're going to get questions on the final exam, an example, you're going to get some x versus y data and then I'm going to ask you, okay, you know what, uh, uh, what is the, uh, now use an interpolation method, use this one, linear interpolator and tell me what the value is at x is 6. Then you should know how to do that. And then I tell you, now use a spline interpolator, tell me what the value is at uh, uh, x is 6. And now you uh, uh, use a p-chip interpolator, remember we talked about it, it's one of the options in interp1. So in principle you can do almost everything with the function interp1. So that's the interpolation uh, uh, chapter, chapter 10. Then numerical integration, that is, we know how to do analytical integration, and numerical integration is when we have functions that we cannot analytically derive the antiderivative. So we need a numerical method. There we have a trapezoidal rule and we have Simpson's rule. You should know, both those rules you should know. The rules at the end 
I think of lecture 21 or so where you have the three, three over eight rule, you have whatever rule, those are, you, that's fine. You don't uh, have a look at it, but it's not so important. What's important is that you do know Simpson's rule and that you know the trapezoidal rule and their composite implementation. Okay? And again, that's also functions built in MATLAB with the trap C function that's built in MATLAB and with the quad and the quad L function. So you should know how to use those built-in functions because we're going to give you a function and we're going to ask you to numerically integrate that function. And you should know the difference between open and closed intervals and how to, do, and how to deal with improper integrals. And improper means where you have minus infinity or infinity. Yeah, because that's always what we like to do mathematically. We integrate the function between zero and infinity. But how do we apply infinity in computer programming? So we can use a really large number, like 1 e to the power 100, so it's 1 with 100 zeros. But then, sometimes that might not work, that might give an error. Then we can use 1 e to the power 10. We use a slightly smaller value, still large, but that might work, but might not give you the exact result. So please have a look at that. Okay? Now, this chapter, you should know how to solve an ordinary differential equation, a single one, using the built-in ODE solver, ODE45. You should know how to solve coupled differential equation and you should know how to do that with an inline function and how to do that with a function script. Yeah? And um, yeah, you should know Euler's method and the midpoint method and Hohn's method. Okay? We'll leave it with that. Those three you should know and those three you should be able to program. Okay? Because I might ask you a question where we, where we ask you like, okay, you know what, we have this um, particular differential equation, tell me what Euler's method predicts the value to be of y at time is 2. And the time step h is 0 0.5. Then you should be able to implement that. And the same with the midpoint method. And then Hunt's method, which are all very closely linked. If we go to uh, Runga Kuta method, then what we will do, uh, we might give you just beyond K1 and K2, which are the same for the midpoint method and the Hunt's method, we might give you K3 and K4. Okay? And the solution how to integrate, divided by 6, divide by K1 divided by 6, K3 divided, or K2 divided by 3, K3 divided by 3, and K4 divided by 6, I believe. That's the integration rule then. Okay, so that's this stuff. Are there any questions? Thanks for showing up, by the way. Could you show how to set up a Lagrange uh, basis? But that's in the, uh, um, in the lecture, yeah? Like, uh, now I have to go back to the lecture script. Uh, here we go, codes, chapter 10, is it chapter 10? Yeah. Let's see. This is here, Mono Lagrange. So here we have some data, for instance, yeah, x versus y. And we have three data points, so that's also called that we have three support points, yeah? So the definition of an, this is one with a monomial basis. And that's really easy to solve, by the way, a monomial basis if you use the function poly call and poly fit. And that goes back to chapter two of the book almost, okay? You can solve immediately a, 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 a monomial basis interpolator. Yeah, so have a look at help poly fit. 
polyfit finds the coefficients of a polynomial of degree n that fits the data y best in a least square sense. So that's what we're doing. And this is the function script. Yeah? Now, and that's identical to this function script, essentially. That's identical. Where they call it n plus 1 coefficients. In our case, we have n coefficients, so we have n minus 1 is the highest order, but it is, it's just, oh, it's the same. So that's the one with the monomial basis. So once you have x and y data, yeah, x, oh, we should clear all. So. If we have some x and y data, then you can simply do, like for instance, x is random uh, 1,5, y is rand These are the corresponding y values, and now I do polyfit x comma y, and now I need polynomial and probably it, let's see what happens here. So this is what I need order four. So if I use a, an, an, uh, an uh, order four polynomial, then this is coefficient one of the monomial uh, uh, basis. This is coefficient two, coefficient three, coefficient four, coefficient five. Okay, so this is one with a monomial basis. Okay, so you can use polyfit for that. Now, if you now go to one with a, and that's all done here, you can also use the van der Monde uh, solver for this, okay? It's a little bit more complicated, but gives you the same result. You can check that at home. Now, one with a Lagrange basis, this is the definition of one with a Lagrange basis, okay? So what do we have? We have something that says we have the polynomial, this is of uh, uh, order one, is y1, this is our first observed y observation, times the first basis L1 plus y2 times L2. So this assumes that we only have two y values, okay? So that is an example that we have, for instance, we have x is zero and x is two, We both have a y value, and now we like to predict what the, uh, what the y value have, uh, is at x is 1. Now, and the basis you simply compute from 229 and 230. So where x is, so, oh, so this is the example where we have, for instance, x is 0 and 2, and y is no, yeah, uh, 5 and 10. So one would assume that the one at x is 1 is 7.5 or so. So what you do is you just said that you just follow this. So now I have to be careful. Uh, so what we like to, so L1x, oh, let's see if this works. L1 is uh, minus, or what is it, x is 1. We like to resolve the value at x is 1, minus x2 is 2 divided by, yeah, better do this way, x1 minus x2. So this is L1, it's 0.5, yeah? L2 is, again, what is our x value? That is 1 minus, what is our x1 value? Is 0, yeah? Divided by x2 minus x1 is 0.5. So what is now our interpolator, we go back here, is this one here. So P1, so that's P1, is our interpolator, so it's Y1 times 0.5 plus Y2 times 0.5 is 7.5. Are you guys following this? So these were my x values, these were the corresponding y values, and I just, now the question is predict what the value is at y at x is 1. Now we, we, one would assume with a Lagrange basis, that's essentially a linear interpolator, okay, and that comes back later in the script, okay, 
that essentially the one with the Lagrange is a linear interpolation. So if I have to predict the value at x is 1, I would somehow average these two values because 1 is in the middle of x is 0 and x is 2. So I'm in the middle between 5 and 10, so I would assume that it's something around 7.5. So what did I do? I used this polynomial because I have two data points. Yeah? And I just filled out what L1 was, that is, here is L1, is x, that's the value at which we like to interpolate, that was 1, minus x2 is 2, divided by x1, oh, minus x2, and it gives us 0.5. L2 is x, which is 1 again, minus x1, and x1 is 0, yeah, here, 0, again, divided by this, and now we fill out the formulation that is y1 times 0.5 because this is L1 plus y2 times L2. And that gives you 7.5. That's how you set it up. If we have more data points, you just add L3, L4. And how to do that, that's in the script. It's not, it's not so difficult. But typically, remember, that a Lagrange basis is very closely related to a linear interpolator. Because what I can do, I can do this, interp1, my value of x and y, and I want the value at 1. And it gives 7.5. And then this might go too fast, so I do help interp1. And it says here, this 1D interpolation, which we have, because we only have one variable, and it says here that x are my x values that I observed, y are the corresponding y values, and xi is the value at which I like to estimate y. Now, that's what I did. x I was a vector with two values, 0 and 2, y was the corresponding y values, 5 and 10, and xi is 1. So that's what we did here in our function here, x, y and 1, it gives us 7.5. So what happens now if I do 10? It gives not a number, okay? So it's also useful to talk about. So how do we call this? Is this interpolation or something else? Pardon? Yes, because we have our x values were between 0 and 2. And now I ask to predict y at x is 10. So this is way outside our interval. And this is typically what interpolators will do. Well-written interpolators will tell you in nice language, a human would say something different. A computer says, not a number. In other words, I don't know what to do. Because you're asking me to predict the y value at x is 10. So I have to predict, like, if this is x is 0, yeah, and then x is 2, those are the two data points we have. We know why, and that's like 5 and 10. And now we want to know what is the value at x is 10. And then the interpolator is going to look like the only thing I know is that at the left side I have x is 2, but at the right side of x is 10 I have nothing. I have nothing that I can use for interpolation, so it says I'm stuck. I don't know what to do anymore. I only have one thing at the left, which is x is 2, but I have nothing that is larger than x is 10 as a reference, what the value of y is there. And that's why it says not the number. So, but with 1, it gives 7.5, which is the same as our monomial. And if you have more bases, then this is, for instance, 1 with 3x values. And that's why it's a second order Lagrange basis. Okay, where you have L1, L2, and L3. Okay, and this typically is sufficient if you do piecewise inter uh, interpolation. Okay, because why do we have piecewise interpolation? If we have 100 data points, you don't want to have to fit a 99th order polynomial through the data and then use that to predict what the y value is at some given x value, because that's really unstable, a 99th order polynomial. You have something to the power 99 plus something to the power 98. So what you're going to have is really 
oscillatory behavior and, and really not good behavior. You want to have a stable polynomial, so that's why you don't want the order to be too high. And that's why with the 100 data points, instead of using them all, what you're going to say, if you interpolate, you're just going to look in the, where, the area where you like to interpolate, you use the point around that interval and you use those to set up a local polynomial function. And you use that for interpolation because it's more stable because then you don't need 99th order uh, polynomial. But that was all in the script, yeah? So here I actually write out for those, if we have higher order, how you set this up, okay? There's logic actually in here, believe it or not. So, um, any other question? Go ahead. So the built-in uh, function quad and quad L, is that, like, is that similar to using the Simpson rule to calculate the area? Okay, so the built-in function, yes, it uses uh, um, a slightly different rule. But what you're going to need to know is if we will explicitly ask you if we ask for Simpson or we ask for something else, yeah? Quad is slightly different because it's an adaptive Simpson rule, okay? If I, likely I will not ask you to do the adaptive variant because then you're going to do something the same as composite interpolation where on smaller intervals you're going to use the rule. So it depends on how you implement it. If you use one interval, yes, they are the same. But if you use the adaptive variant, which is in quad, then they might not be the same compared to a Simpson rule which you apply over the entire interval. It's hard to see you guys with the wonderful uh, sunshine. My God. So yeah, like uh, I've had that before. Yeah, like when when you go to um, like win a scientific uh, medal or so, then you actually, you know, then there's all these people sitting in the audience, and then they 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 announce your name, and then you come up, and then they have the light. You don't realize that. So first of all, you sit in the back. Yeah, it's like eight o'clock at night. They give you your award. Yeah, and there's no alcohol there. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So you see all these people sit. You have people there that 95. They win something because they've done something. That's their entire career. Then you have people that are much younger. Yeah, because these are younger awards. Yeah, and uh, so you're sitting there, and then these guys that they can hardly move anymore. The person that's 95. Yeah which I've seen one time, then you go to a Neil Diamond concert, yeah? And then they suddenly come alive. It's unbelievable, you see that, then Neil Diamond comes up. I don't know if you guys know who Neil Diamond is, but it's like the best medication there is. There were people there that are sitting in a wheelchair, yeah? That are barely breathing anymore. As soon as he starts sitting, they, they jump up and they're like, for two hours they are alive. And then as soon as he stops, they go back in their wheelchair. But it's the same thing with these scientific conferences. When you go up then and you, you win a prize, you actually have to say something meaningful, yeah? But the first thing you see is you see this big light. And you have all these screens and all that stuff. And, and so you go up. And, and, and what's always nice to be able to focus in the audience if you say something that it makes sense, yeah? But you don't see a single thing. Like right now, I'm completely blinded. I don't even know where there are students sitting in this room. So it's so bad. But anyway, so get used to it. If you want to continue in academia, continue to get, really get used to light. And fortunately, in, in California, there's enough light, yeah, and enough sunshine here. Imagine that you're from Amsterdam. You know, if you go out drinking here, which you guys are not supposed to do, and you have a hangover, then here, at 10 o'clock in the morning, you will go back to work again, yeah, because there's enough sunlight, there's enough energy. In Amsterdam, now, if you do that in winter time. There's no sunshine till like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. It's overcast. Uh, you stay in your bed the entire day, honestly. So I remember going to Arizona and going out every night. And then at 6, I went to bed at 2, 3 o'clock. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, it was so hot in my room that you go back to work, yeah? And that you feel better again in an hour. It's amazing. It's the sunshine here. It's, so be happy that you live in California. There's many wonderful things in this place, yeah? You guys are all lucky. I just came here because of the weather. No, it's not true. No, but the weather makes a big difference. Uh, makes you happier overall. It's a useful factor.